Good morning. Dear invited guests and fellow NAPA fellows, welcome to the annual meeting of the National Academy of Public Administrator, uh, Administration, Traitors. Pardon me. My name is Ramaya Krishnan, Dean of the Heinz College of Information Systems and Public Policy. The theme of this year's meeting is strengthening social and economic development through meaningful work. This topic has particular relevance here at CMU as our home, the city of Pittsburgh, is often held up as a shining example of a community that has mounted a comeback after losing our economic moorings in the late 20th century. This post-industrialization story is well known and is playing out all over the country. Unfortunately, many places have not been able to regain their footing in the way Pittsburgh has. In response, in 2018, with the help of Carnegie Mellon alumnus Keith Block, we established the Block Center for Technology and Society here at CMU. The mission of this important research center is to ensure technology-driven economic prosperity is shared widely. How we do that is the topic of today's discussion. Let me now turn our attention to our first session, and it promises to be an outstanding one. Our mayor's panel on job growth features two superstars. Andy Burke served as mayor of Chattanooga, Tennessee from 2013 through 2021. Under his leadership, Chattanooga took bold steps to harness the unique advantage of having fast, cheap, and pervasive internet service. Following a robust public engagement process, Chattanooga established an innovation district, 140 acres in the heart of downtown that houses a catalytic mix of startup businesses, incubators, and accelerators alongside investors and public amenities. In addition, the city partnered with various nonprofits, businesses, and county government to launch Tech Goes Home, a program honored for digital inclusion leadership by the National League of Cities and Google. At the end of his term, he led a partnership to provide high-speed broadband at no cost to every family with a child on free or reduced lunch, making Chattanooga the first community in the country with such a benefit. Andy currently serves as administrator of the Rural Utilities Service of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Bill Peduto, served as mayor of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania from 2014 to earlier this year. The Peruto administration under his leadership operated with, under the guidance of the principle, if it's not for all, it's not for us, to ensure that all Pittsburghers benefited from the city's incredible growth. He championed the one Pittsburgh resiliency strategy and technological upgrades, including a GPS-based snowplow, snowplow tracker website, 311 Response Center mobile app, an interactive street paving website, and several digital tools built with public information on an open data portal. Bill currently serves as executive in residence right here at CMU's Heinz College of Information Systems and Public Policy. Before I turn this over to Andy and Bill, I want to um, let everybody know that if they have questions, they should um, enter them on slido.com, hashtag N-A-P-A, Napa 22. Slido.com, hashtag Napa 22. With that, let me turn this over to Andy and Bill. Andy, Bill, welcome. Thank you, Dean. Andy, welcome to Pittsburgh. It's great to have you back. I think you were here about a month ago. Yeah, it's great to be with you, and thanks to Carnegie Mellon and to Napa for inviting me here. So I, I like to get uh, around and, and see such a great city, and thanks for the job that you did in, in making it an even better place. I, I think uh, for the sake of uh, the audience that we have, uh, professionals that work in public administration, uh, I, I can't start without saying what an honor it was 
to be a part of that class of 2013. Uh, we had an exceptional class. I think it was part of a movement that was happening at that time, and it was a politics that you don't see today. There's a polarization in politics today that when we were mayors, we worked across aisles without even knowing what political party um, the other person was, was, was. Yeah, no, I mean, now I'm in the Biden administration, obviously believe in the work that we're doing, and I'm proud of that. Uh, there's something different and special about being in local government, and so talking about that reminds me of the amazing progress that you can make and achieve and see those things. You know, I was walking down here looking at sidewalks. Um, last week I was someplace else. I won't say where I was, or actually earlier this week, I was complaining about the way that the things were laid out. And so local administrators make big decisions that affect everybody's life on a daily basis. And uh, and so I love that part of the job. I loved it. And I'm sure you did too. Yeah, I, I don't go to a city without looking at the garbage cans. <laughs> um, but let's get into that. So, you know, Chattanooga, Pittsburgh have a very common history. But uh, why don't you just walk us through a little bit of that history. But during those eight years that you were mayor, how you were able to bring Chattanooga into the 21st century? Well, I think that you kind of have to start with a little bit of our history, and I'd love to kind of hear how you think that Chattanooga's history is the same or different than Pittsburgh's, because uh, two things happened in the early part of the 20th century. Number one is uh, a man went down to Atlanta and bought the rights to bottle Coca-Cola in perpetuity for $1 plus the cost of syrup. Um, this brought tremendous wealth into our community. And second is we built steel mills and foundries all over the middle of our city. Uh, it brought more wealth to our community, uh, but it also brought smog and, and all kinds of dirt. And Chattanooga is a valley surrounded by mountains with a river that cuts through the middle. And so as the smoke billowed out, everything stayed in that area, hovered around, and famously in 1969, Walter Cronkite, who was then um, described as the most trusted man in America and the CBS broadcaster did a one hour report on Chattanooga calling it the dirtiest city in America. So um, we took this beautiful place and we made it incredibly dirty and a place that would be highlighted not for its greatness but for its problems. And before I ever became mayor, there were decades of work that went into changing that story as well as important federal policies like Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, and other things that, that many communities used, like ours. But when I became mayor, um, one of the things that we needed to do was to shed that past and to start thinking about what we could be. And so we had the, the fastest, cheapest, most pervasive internet in the world. We built uh, in Chattanooga a fiber optic system that went to every home and business. And so it became a, a central point for us to define who we wanted to be, not as what we had lost, but what we could become. And that was a place with innovators and entrepreneurs, as the dean was talking about, uh, and, and a place where everybody could be part of this, a city of creators um, for, for those people who, um, who could become and say, here's what I think that I can be, and that's part of, of Chattanooga. And so that, we had one of the highest wage growths in the country in 2024, we said we'd be the number one place for new jobs. And I think it shows that communities can control their future if they, if they do what's necessary to, to, you know, to make those big strides. How, what do you think that does? How do you think that compares to Pittsburgh's history? I, I, exactly the same. So, um, you know, Pittsburgh led the world in the transformation of the second industrial revolution, the electrification of heavy industry. Um, you know, Nicholas Tesla used to hang out with George Westinghouse just down the street, playing around down in George Westinghouse's basement. Um, and you know, the, the idea that you would be able to utilize electricity to mass produce steel and other products really took off in the United States right here in Pittsburgh. And even during World War II, we were able to produce more steel 
in this region than Germany and Japan combined. Um, and, and the legacy afterwards, when those nations were decimated, the world looked towards Pittsburgh and basically every skyscraper and every bridge around this country uh, was built here. Um, but at that same time, we produced air that was dangerous to breathe. We produced water that was poisonous to drink. And we created the greatest disparity between the haves and the have-nots, between the people who managed and owned the mills and the people like my grandfathers that worked in them. And we just considered those externalities through a model of 19th century economics. It never changed throughout the 20th century. Understanding that urban economics don't look at those factors as externalities because we are the ones that have to deal with them. When we have to deal with disparity, we're dealing with poverty and we're dealing with crime. We're dealing with uh, children that are facing health issues. We're dealing with families that are going to be left behind. We have to be able to create economic development models that address them at the forefront. So we created a resiliency plan uh, starting with 100 Resilient Cities with the Rockefeller Foundation, working with Bloomberg and our local uh, philanthropic community to be able to identify where those challenges are presently and where they'll be. And some of them are man-made, some of them are natural, uh, some of them are due to man-made nature, such as climate change, and recognizing where they were and what we could do in order to be able to address them. And I think where that commonality comes back is knowing that city government doesn't have the capacity to do it alone. That if you're going to be able to solve these types of problems, you are going to have to create partnerships. And they're not the, the typical partnerships that we think about just public-private. In many cases, that is driven by private return on investment. But they also involve institutions, or like I like to call it, PIPs, public institution, private. And looking at institutions like Carnegie Mellon, uh, we were able to partner and create Metro Lab. Um, and looking at utilizing innovation as a key component of creating plans for the future of Pittsburgh. Yeah, I think th that's such an important point. So it's almost impossible for, for anybody to go it alone in today's world. The problems that we face are so complex, and, and also they require long-term kind of work. And that's sometimes going to outlast mayors, um, as as you and I both uh, both know. It's going to outlast uh, the ten years of university presidents. It's going to continue on, and so getting that kind of buy-in is so important to to establish uh, institution to institution relationships. So one of the things that I did when I was mayor, um, the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga and the city of Chattanooga had never been never been aligned, uh, and so. Just doing something simple like we established a monthly meeting between me and the chancellor of the university. Now, I was fortunate that this chancellor came in right after I became mayor and wanted to have that kind of relationship. But then we could work on little things. And sometimes he would bring me little things like, we're telling you we want to stop sign. Your people are saying no. Can you talk to them about that? Two big things like we need to get the university deeper involved in the in the innovation district. Can you can you put some uh, institutional support behind the work that's being done there? And that kind of institutional, public, private stuff that you're talking about, which by the way, we were one of the first uh, people to join Metro Lab. Mm -hmm. I forgot that y'all had uh, y'all had established that. Th that is. That's how you get things done in a, in a in an area, and and not everybody has the same the same types of assets. We know that not every community has that, but you could still find what you have and try to take advantage of whatever that is. And sometimes even the act of doing that is really important for your community's growth. Don't you think? Oh, without a doubt. So 
going, you know, with our friends who are mayors in northern Appalachia, and um, I'm sure that you know pretty much all of them, Steve Williams in Huntington, uh, the mayor of Morgantown, Tito in Youngstown, Nan Whaley in Dayton, John Cranley in uh, Cincinnati, uh, Andy in Columbus. We, we put together what we called the Marshall Plan for Middle America, and we looked at it as how can we meet the goals of the Paris Agreement? But what if we didn't make it a climate action plan, but an economic development strategy? And so nine cities, including Athens, Ohio, Louisville, Kentucky, uh, all along the Ohio River Basin. And, you know, we had been targeted for our what's under our feet, natural gas. And we, we were looking at it as, what if we start looking at the ability to move toward renewable? And not only that, did you ever see the movie Tommy Boy? Yes. Okay. Callahan Breaks? Yes. Little town, they lose Callahan Breaks, the town leaves. How do we identify companies that are already scattered throughout northern Appalachia? And even though they've been making this one part for 120 years identify, you know, they could be making this other part for solar panels and be around for the next 100 years exporting it globally. And now with the Biden administration's IRA funds, the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill, there's money there to be able to, to build this stuff. Yeah. And, but what's key to this is that every one of those cities, Huntington, Marshall University, Morgantown, WVU, Athens, Ohio University, Youngstown, Youngstown State, Dayton, Dayton University, Louisville, Louisville, uh, Columbus, Ohio State, has that institution to be a part of that economic development model. So that company doesn't have to know about what that part is because that city can work on the government side of being able to deliver the funds. That university can help to identify the innovation of what that company needs and that company can build. Yeah. So whoever had Tommy Boy on their bingo card today, they're probably going to win uh, yeah. for, for us to be talking about that. Um, no, let me let me just say a couple of things. And, and first of all, I have to plug my current job, which is um, I'm the administrator of the Rural Utility Service. We actually have $11 billion of uh, Inflation Reduction Act funding that's supposed to go towards renewable energy and helping uh, these communities convert and and i i tell people all the time like how how do you make this personal it's exactly what you're you're talking about so in 1969 as i said we were called the dirtiest city in america and as we were seeing this growth in our community during the the 2010s i would say to everybody does anybody think that this would be happening if we were still the dirtiest city in america right does anybody think that these that these companies would come here, that these families would want to move to our city if we were the dirtiest community in our country? And so on top of that, we started to figure out as we make these improvements, just like you're like you're talking about, like in my current job, like I try to talk to communities about all the time, is take your infrastructure. You have the bipartisan infrastructure law, which has money for for internet, which I, you know, also help administer, which has money for roads and everything else in it and, and clean it, clean energy and take advantage of that for economic development. It's not just about doing these, these great things for our world, which is, believe me, plenty important. But when we built our internet out, it wasn't just, okay, we built this out. Now we're done. It was, how can we use this to recruit companies here? How can we use it to to help our um, families get on and become more adept at whatever skills that they want. How can we, how can this be an engine? How can our infrastructure be an, an engine for growth and opportunity for everybody, by the way? And that's one of the great things about infrastructure is you try to open up the world for more people, which is something that I know you talked a lot about and cared a lot about is making that more inclusive. Well, let's go into that for a second, because you created the model for broadband for American cities. And some states have preempted local governments from being able to do what you did because of lobbyists from 
different providers of internet services. They were able to get in there and create laws that would not allow local governments to compete, even though those airways belong to the people. Um, and I'll just leave it at that. However, what you did create was that opportunity to provide information and power to the people of Chattanooga to be able to have this this opportunity. I, it goes without saying, but how did you do it? I mean, you're talking about you have a budget, you have infrastructure that's falling apart, you have a police department that needs to be funded, you have all the different needs of a community. It it really becomes difficult to look at something of that magnitude and be able to say, yeah, we're going to build this too. We're going to build out our own utility system. Yeah, so Chattanooga, we were lucky, and I want to make sure people in the audience understand what, what exactly went on there. So Chattanooga was lucky we have a public power model. So we have a municipally owned utility um, that has provided electric service going back to the to the early days of power in our country and in our area. Um, we use that to build out a fiber system to every home and business. We did that in part to build a, a smart grid for electricity and to make that more efficient, more resilient to storms, provide cheaper power to people. And then also um, turned on because uh, just one little geek thing, we are, at, we are at Carnegie Mellon, so I have to, we can do a little bit of, uh, of science here. One strand of fiber can theoretically carry all the data in the world because it's glass and things move at the speed of light. Okay, I'm done with my science uh, for the day. Uh, that may also be the limits of my science abilities. Um, so, so once you turn that on, you could find out what, what are all the different things we can use fiber for, like providing data service to every person, like providing phone or video or whatever it might be. And so our community um, built this network to every home and business, and then started figuring out how we took advantage of it. And as as you said, the, one of the last things that that did started that journey at the beginning. And then the last thing that I did while I was mayor was to make that free um, for every family with a child on free or reduced lunch. And so I think there's a big piece of this that was that's just okay. We had some really smart people. This wasn't me. It's not like I'm thinking of okay. Here, here's what you do with fiber. Um, but we had really smart people and we encouraged it and we looked at the opportunity, not the barriers, because there are plenty of barriers in these things. Uh, we tried to get huge amounts of institutional support behind the things that we were doing. We pitched it not as a project in and of itself, but how did it fit into our community vision for the things that we could become and the places that Chattanooga could go you know, for, for its community. And I think that that's really Th that's really the lesson to be learned is um, if you have good leadership, I'm not talking about me, but lots of people around, um, you, th you have a common vision, you plan, you execute, and you figure out how this this gets to help everybody, then, then you can make some real strides and progress. And what I'd be interested in hearing from you is like, don't you, did you see similar opportunities and problems in Pittsburgh as you tried to get community support for some of your biggest, some of the biggest things that you try to do, including these resiliency initiatives. Yeah, without a doubt. And, um, you know, we, we had put together a plan. To, we, took, we spent several years putting it together. We had countless meetings uh, involved, I think, over 150 organizations that uh, not only Pittsburgh based, but regionally based nonprofits, for profits, everybody and, and getting uh, the ideas of where, where the need was. We, we put together uh, one of the first uh, gender equity studies that focused on race, then looked at specifically targeted cities that uh, were had the most commonality to Pittsburgh and found out we were doing the worst out of those cities that we studied uh, in several different categories and basically used data in order to be able to then go back to our largest nonprofits, uh, 
Carnegie Mellon University of Pittsburgh, UPMC, our hospital system, and the Allegheny uh, General Hospital and uh, Highmark Health um, and the insurance company, and saying, hey, look, we need your help in being able to put together a plan where we're rowing together. We're not, we're not saying you have to do this or that, but here's the menu. Where, what, what are your missions? And if we start to work together on these different missions, we're going to be able to lessen the amount of whatever it is, uh, people who are uh, having trouble with affordable housing, uh, people that are having trouble with workforce development, and all these different criteria. But the other thing that we did is we understood that one of the areas that was critical, and this goes back, and I want to talk a little bit about basically the workforce uh, and the workforce in Chattanooga, uh, we realized that, you know, as we were coming out of 2013, 2014, 2015, we were seeing prosperity in Pittsburgh. And we had not seen this for, for decades. And we were seeing great economic development investment. Uh, we saw over $10 billion of investment in eight years in an area that hadn't seen barely a billion in a decade prior. And, and the idea was that it needed to be so that everybody was benefiting. So we met with the largest employer, UPMC, and we said, we're going to raise the minimum wage for all city employees to $15 an hour. And we expect you to do the same. And without any written contract or anything else, they did it. And then PNC Bank did it. And by 2019, the poverty rate in Pittsburgh went below 20% for the first time, I think, within my lifetime, or at least since the 1970s. The crime rate in the city of Pittsburgh decreased in 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, and 2019 until we hit COVID. Um, but every year, because economic opportunity was being provided to the lowest paid workers. And you saw an overall effect happening culturally. We were able to almost completely eradicate veteran homelessness, uh, taking it from a level of around 400 to 20. Those types of things happen when you concentrate efforts on everyone instead of simply on the economic development or profit. And I just wanted to throw it back to you about the same type of question. In Chattanooga, and as you're traveling the country now with your new job with the Biden administration, what you're seeing with the workers, what you're seeing with the opportunities, especially with what we're facing with inflation today, and how we can create those economic development models, especially within cities, that can benefit the lowest paid workers. So, so I'm really interested to, to throw this question back to you because I, I want to know, uh, Bill and I know each other pretty well. <laughs> it's been a lot of time together. But I'd be interested to hear your ideas about economic development because I think this is something that, that the administrators probably – think about on a regular basis. And when I got started as mayor, I'd be interested to hear your experience. Everything was about CapEx. How much money, this company wants to come here, they want to invest $500 million, a billion dollars, whatever that number is, $25 million. And they want incentives, they want this, they want that, and the other. And somewhere down, you had to kind of pull the sheets up, you would say like, not only how many jobs, it might say how many jobs, but somewhere down it would say average pay. Like, but you had to flip a few few pages up before you found that. Yeah. And pretty quickly, I like people got the idea that when they came to see me, it was like, no, no, let's let's kind of reverse this. I'd like to know how much people are getting paid for these 
these incentives that, that, that they want? You know, how much are the workers going to get paid? Not only how many jobs, but what kind of jobs are these? And the CapEx, I understand, um, and we're, again, we have a bunch of smart people here at Carnegie Mellon who could tell me all the reasons that CapEx was important to Chattanooga, but a lot of the CapEx was was money that was benefiting other places, not not us. And so I really tried to flip that model as much as possible when I looked at it, and hopefully to establish a culture, even around economic development, that was much more focused on worker and worker pay. I don't know that I was always successful, but it seemed it seemed to to at least change uh, a pretty good piece of what we we're doing. And I'm just curious, as I know you had those same conversations about incentives and things like that. How did you think about that? So we actually created a metric. Uh, we called it P4, People, Planet, Place, and Performance. And it was weighted so that when people were looking for government funding for a, a, a development or a project, we would put it through the algorithm and it would come out with a score. Pittsburgh has to have an algorithm for everything. Is yeah. that is that is that the deal? Yeah, it's it's sort of like a filter. That, yeah, um, but anyways, it, and uh, we would then go back to them, the whoever it was that we were working with, and you have to do better here. You have to do better there. I used to tell my chief of staff, Dan Gilman, I said, you know, the one thing that um, Jewish mothers and Italian mothers teach us that we always have to use is the most powerful weapon in the world: guilt. And um, so it's a very powerful tool to go back to a developer and say, don't embarrass me. Um, you know, when you're hiring carpenters, make sure they're union. You know, don't don't cut out and try to make your savings on the back of the workers that are going to build this building or the people who are going to be at the front desk of the hotel or the people who are going to be making the bed. Um, and so... Even with the contracts that would come up with uh, security guards and those that cleaned offices, I actually went into the meetings with the property management companies, and I would show them the amount in downtown and in Oakland of how their rates have been going up per square feet and saying to them, you need to be able to share it with your workers. Don't embarrass me. And our uh, workers, uh, especially with SEIU 32BJ, uh, received raises across the board. I think now they're earning over $18 an hour. And most of them live in the city, in neighborhoods like the Hill District. And when they start to earn better wages, their families don't have better lives. You know, when I ran uh, back in 2005, I ran like two and a half times. So the one half time was, it was a horrible campaign. But uh, I, I had a saying, it just came out at a, in a debate. I was getting angry because people were kept looking for the answer to crime through more police, more police. And I just said, you want to take a gun out of a young person's hand, put a paycheck in it. And it, it's, it's understanding that holistic economic model that happens in urban areas that I think mayors understand at a much, much deeper level. Yeah. Well, what you're talking about is so important in places like Chattanooga because we don't have the history of unionization that you do in Pittsburgh, and we don't have the worker protection laws that you do in the state of Pennsylvania. And so for us, and, and i imagine for a lot of people who are on this webcast, um, a lot of the leadership comes locally when it when you start talking about workers. And you have to make some decisions and some calls about how much energy and effort do you want to put into pressuring. And a lot of it is is pressure. And maybe you have some carrots and, and very few sticks usually, but some carrots. Um, and And I think for me... Um, one of the things that I came to very quickly is that 
you know, when you start talking about inequality, which was a huge issue for the years that you and I were mayor, people talked about income inequality for, for many of those years. Um, that has to do with tax policy and the Fed and all kinds of things that, that we have a hard time controlling. But when you start talking about social mobility, the ability for somebody to raise their standard of living to become higher in, in the way that they live their life economically, um, now that's something that, that local officials can do something about, making sure that the workers you're talking about have, have some opportunity. Um, we can't necessarily lower the gap between the, the highest of the and the lowest, but we can help people move up the up the ladder. And so um, making that a true priority, and by the way, also talking about it, just just talking about it is helpful, I think, to people, don't you? Without a doubt. And I, I think having the information readily available that allows people to see you know, from census data to research that is being done, how has the community benefited? Not simply how has the tax rolls benefited, but how has the community benefited? How have, how have the decisions made utilizing public funds for investment actually benefited the community at large? Um, and getting that type of information out, it, that, that type of stuff seems to be left in the universities or within uh, the chambers of commerce, and they don't seem to get out to the general public. I think there is an appetite for this. One, one thing I want to uh, uh, make sure that we hit on, um, an organization that's important to both of us is the Strong Cities Network. And as you're aware, Pittsburgh joined after the Tree of Life, uh, the Strong Cities Network is a group of 160 cities around the world on every continent that are committed to eradicating hate, um, understanding the negative effects of polarization and uh, extremism, uh, believing that if we are to be able to work to move the needle on this, we need to start working bipartisan at the local level to build the foundation for federal governments to start to address it. Um, your work on it um, throughout the years has, has been as a leader. How do you see this movement today? Um, and secondly, how do you see it in the United States, given where we are. I mean, obviously, last week's news, and it seems to be a constant drumbeat of uh, extremist actions. Uh, how do we move it? How do we get cities more involved? I'm sure, like you, I was really upset about the attack on Mr. Pelosi. Like, really upset. And... Uh, I think I went to a, I was on some kind of meeting, some big meeting afterward. And I just, I was one of those deals where I just had to say, I was kind of, I was supposed to speak on something else. So I just had to, let me, can I just take two minutes here and just say, this, this is so disturbing. It's so disturbing to have political violence in our country. And um, like you, uh, we had a domestic terror attack in Chattanooga. Uh, where um, a uh, assailant killed um, four Marines and a sailor uh, in 2015. Uh, and I became very involved in countering violent extremism. Uh, had, that, had that personal experience and, and tied to it. Um, and I think... For us as a country, we have to take this seriously. And that does mean at the local level, making sure that we value our inclusivity and each other and talk about these values that, that we care about. And so um, to me, Bill, you know, and, and you've been talking a little bit about violence and let's talk specifically about gun violence. There are all these people who feel like they're left out on the margins of society. They don't feel like they're in the, included in prosperity. They don't feel like they're included in the social fabric of the community. And 
they get alienated and some of them may turn to gun violence because they get involved with groups that encourage that and take advantage of their alienation and disaffection and perhaps poor economic status. And there are groups that say, you know what you should do? You should, uh, like the assailant in Chattanooga, watched ISIS videos online. That's, that's what he did. So uh, we, we just can't, that's not, we're democracy. Like you just read the political science textbooks. This is like, if, if you start looking at the, the, the warning signs for our country, this one, is, this one is serious. And I know the president talked about this last night, but um, don't you think that we as local leaders have tremendous responsibility, no matter where you are, no matter whether you're a mayor or administrator, to be focused in on countering violent extremism? Yes, and you know, I see it on both sides. I, I, I see in cities where young people by the age of 15 seem so lost that they've given up hope of their lives and they have guns. And here in Pittsburgh last week, we had two young people going to a funeral in walking into a church and opening fire. I mean, and, and you see it in a rural area where somebody else will get a gun and shoot other people. And I think that there's this disconnect, like you were saying, where these, for the most part, young people, but sometimes middle-aged people, mostly men, don't see a place for themselves in the future. They just, you know, and, and in some cases, it's uh, it's a world that's changing, and and they don't see a place for them. And other times, it is that there is no pathway being built at all, and it is by design, tax structures, economic development strategies, housing policies, healthcare access, education. And you, you tend to see these paths leading to these types of extreme decisions that lead to violence. It sort of, it, it comes back around. Um, just curious, you know, is looking at it uh, from a more, not just local standpoint, but a more federal standpoint, what type of opportunities can help to lessen that isolationist lack of hope? Well, I think we are trying to do those things. That, I mean, the tremendous investments that have been made in our country over the last year and a half, two years, um, will have lots of ripple effects. All the things that you were talking about, the investments from the bipartisan infrastructure law, from CARES Act to the Inflation Reduction Act, and but now now it's up to to local. I almost said us, but I can't I can't say that anymore. It's now it's up to local officials to figure out how they're going to use this because these funds are five and ten years of work to be done in them, and so as a local official, you have to start. You have to take the bull by the horns and get out there and say, here's what we want to see, and how do we fit the federal funding and the nationwide strategy that we have into what we're doing here to not just do projects, but to do economic development and inclusion work and the things that, that we're talking about, because going back to this kind of bigger stuff, it's like, this is not someone else's problem. This is not someone else's duty. This is your duty as an American, as a government official, as somebody who cares about your community, if you're not putting these issues first and you're just saying like, hey, our job is we pick up the trash. Like there was a, there was a model of mayor, and I think one of the things you could agree on is like that clash you're talking about in 2013 and, and the people, like the model of mayor and local government has shifted over the year to be a service model. Like we pick up the trash, we make sure your storm drains are clean. We do whatever else. We have we'll operate uh, operate the wastewater system and put potholes, patch potholes. To we lead the community forward, and I think 
we got to take that though. You got to continue to take that model upwards and and outward so that we use the federal funding uh, properly, whatever comes along next that, but that we do it as part of what makes Pittsburgh to be the best Pittsburgh and Chattanooga, the best Chattanooga and wherever people are on here. Uh, because not every not every community needs or wants the same thing, right? Right, but we all steal ideas. <laughs> it's uh, part of being a mayor. Yeah, well, that's that's why I like that's. I think I came here four times when I was mayor uh, for various things, and because I drove into Pittsburgh and saw the beautiful the beautiful bridges and the river and everything. And by the way, you know the amazing universities, which. I will say one of the things that I stole from Pittsburgh was the university city government kind of collaborative uh, model. Um, yeah. what, 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 what are you proud of, of stealing from people? Oh, half my ideas. I just never told anyone I stole them. Yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. You don't, you don't have to, people don't know. Uh, yeah. Hopefully they don't travel to the same place that you went to. It, yeah, no, including f phrases and expressions. But uh, no, I, I um, from Baltimore, uh, they had a summer education slash workforce program uh, that employed uh, thousands of kids, and uh, we replicated it. We started it uh, in year one, and we were able to hire 600 kids, and by the time that I left office, uh, we had over 2,000 kids that uh, had applied, and we gave every kid a job that summer. And uh, we hire, we put them in places like PNC Bank and working in the universities and real jobs, not just cutting grass and painting fences. They were, they were getting real work experience. And um, I had one young woman came up to me, and uh, she just told me that, uh, basically, I can't make decisions for her. She was 15 years old, she said, but I can provide her opportunity. And I was just like, you're right. And uh, it made a, an impact on me that day. So do you, I just want to stop you for a minute there because that, that's an impactful story. Do, do you think that the job of local government and the job of administrator or mayor has become too big? too big no i think that for most of mankind regional government was the main ruling government and it's only been within the past few hundred years that we've moved to this model of national government and i don't believe that national governments have the capacity to rule in the same way as regional governments so if I look at something like the UN SDGs, I think that we have a much better ability to meet them at a local level. If I look at the migrant crisis, I think we can create models at the local level to solve it. If I look at climate change, I think it will be solved by cities. So I think the role of mayor is only starting to move back into the role that it has had throughout the history of mankind. Is it okay? Time for, I think we have some. Am I? Yep. Am I on here? Okay. We actually have a ton of questions rolling in from the audience uh, online and here in person. So uh, let me just just pick out a few for you. Uh, interesting discussion about the Marshall Plan for Middle America. Chattanooga has some real advantages, such as 19th century Coca Cola money and Pittsburgh has similar advantages. Do you have a favorite example of a community leveraging its assets in a positive way, perhaps in a city that doesn't have the advantages of major universities or philanthropies? Well, this, this may be uh, not the, the example that the, question, that the questioner is thinking about, but when I think about local leadership, I can't help but think about Charleston, South Carolina, um, which has one of the, uh, for 44 years, had one of the best mayors, if not the best mayor in the country, and a guy named Joe Riley, and took, I, I don't know if you ever went to Charleston, Bill, but um, basically over time said, we're going we're gonna to care about our 
development. We're going to care about the inclusivity of our community. We're going to get everybody involved. And um, there's another city, uh, I won't name it, that's very similar to Charleston that has like maybe even greater physical advantages that has huge Charleston envy. I spoke there a few times when I was mayor. And I think it was just because they felt like they didn't take advantage of their community in the same way. And you could see how the local leadership just it's one of the, it was just an amazing place. Like, I'm not trying to be a Charleston, uh, you know, uh, tourism official, but but I think that you, you kind of look to me, that was one of the real inspiring moments where I thought to myself, okay, if you make good decisions over time and you get the community involved, um, you can really do amazing things in a city. Uh, and so I, I really think about Charleston. Do you have a, do you have another... I don't have any like specific examples, but you know, a city like Santa Fe, even though it has the university there, it, it's not a major part of Santa Fe's image. Santa Fe's built its own image through its uh, its people, uh, but it's still one of my favorite cities in America, and it's through the collaboration of working with the corporate community, the the people, and others that it, it sort of has built up around it. Um, I'm not sure if it has a philanthropic community, but, you know, Pittsburgh, the only reason that we survived was during the 1980s, our philanthropic community kept our head above the water. It's, it's the money of the uh, Gilded Age that made sure that not only didn't we lose our sports teams and our symphony and our opera and our ballet and everything else, but we built the Andy Warhol Museum, the August Wilson Center, the Children's Museum, the Carnegie Science Center. We doubled down on the arts instead of losing them. And it, it was absolutely essential. And the, the philanthropic community um, basically took the risk that Pittsburgh would come back. Yeah, so the only thing I would just finish off before you ask your next question, John, is do asset mapping like you may not have the same advantages but there's tons of things that chattanooga doesn't have as well that plenty of other communities have and so we always did asset mapping what do we have that we can take advantage of it's not going to be the same thing as pittsburgh or the same like we don't have carnegie mellon we don't have harvard or like i did an event with uh, marty walsh the mayor of then the mayor of of uh, boston i said you know give me MIT and Harvard and Brandeis and Boston University and Boston College, and, you know, let's see what happens, yeah. right? I mean, so we don't have, nobody has the same things, but first thing is figure out what you do have that you can take advantage of. And let's look at Cincinnati and Procter and & Gamble and the impact that that has had on Cincinnati. I mean, uh, they, they've sort of stepped up into the philanthropic role as a corporation so there there are other ways excellent the uh the next question is uh if you could comment on the the trend of working from home and uh particularly in mid-sized cities how is how will mayors think differently about or how should mayors think differently about job creation and job growth when when work from home is a is a trend first off i'm working from home and i hate it <laughs> so um, I, I now understand why people were going crazy during COVID. I was I was down in my office and they're like, "What's the big deal?" It's, it's a big deal. Um, first off, you have to rethink downtown. And the mayors that I talk to, you know, everyone has the same the same concerns that downtown has hollowed out, um, that the workforce isn't there, uh, and. You know, especially in a city like Pittsburgh that has been so reliant on an office uh, commercial use of its downtown, uh, we have to rethink it as a residential neighborhood. Secondly, uh, if you have a city that has universities, there should be conversations about grad schools and other uh, institutions being able to look at downtown as a potential place to, to locate. Uh, it'd be great to have a law school right down next to the uh, law offices and having the students having the opportunity not only to go to class, but 
uh, working in internships at those law offices during the days or a medical school right by the hospitals or the different types of opportunities that a downtown area could uh, give uh, students the opportunity to work and study. Um, and then being able to make it a arts and entertainment center. Um, it needs to be looked at as an 18 to 24 hour uh, area. Uh, what will become uh, over the next several years of uh, return to a, uh, a workforce that we remember pre-COVID? Uh, I still think, you know, that's very unknown. But um, I, I personally don't think that we'll be back to five days in a cubicle in a space that charges a heavy amount per square foot. I think that companies will look to limit the expenses in high density, high cost locations. So I agree with most everything that you just said. I spent most of my time as mayor saying <clears throat> we need to get density we need to have places where people can gather and get really close and have unique experiences and amazing entertainment. Then March of 2020 hit and all those places that we had built and kind of put up as, as gathering spots went, went, went blank. And, uh, that was really hard. Uh, it was hard for me, uh, and kind of the way I looked at cities. It was hard for, think our community in many ways, and it still still is. I think people are still trying to figure out where to go. And so, um, but I still believe, number one, that like at some point creativity does come from density. And so getting people together at some point, there are lots of things that we can do online. There are lots of things that we can do, uh, you know, when we're far away from each other. But at some point, we the, the spark of being close to somebody and discussing things and working with people is going to be important, and we'll we'll learn that we'll learn how to do that differently over time. Uh, the second thing is that there's people are going to be caring about these amenities more than ever because if you're in your home all day, you've got to get out and and see something that's fun and different and exciting. So I agree with you, like having that amazing downtown, that amazing place where people can go, maybe that becomes more valuable. And getting some of this commercial space repurposed for residential. Chattanooga, we were trying to do that anyway because, again, our history, one of the big things we did was we repurposed a bunch of, of Class A space for, for housing because that would make our – that would actually raise the value of our class A space and and bring more people into the community. And so, you know, I think I still think it still remains to be seen, but it remains to be seen is like over 10 years or 15 years, which is not the lifespan of most people who are in this business. So so you, you both presided over success stories, resurgent cities. Um, that were able to kind of find their footing after a kind of post industrial um, collapse might be too strong of a word, but a, a post-industrial um, troubles. W to what extent did the resurgence in each of your cities rely on, depend on, work with state and federal government? In the 1980s, uh, Pittsburgh's unemployment exceeded uh, the unemployment of the Great Depression. Um, we lost more people than New Orleans lost after Hurricane Katrina, and they never came back. And the debt ratio of the city of Pittsburgh exceeded New York City's when it went bankrupt, and there was no federal program and no bailout. And in fact, the federal programs of the 1980s, which allowed for pension funds to be raided through the remaining steel mills were the remaining nails in the coffin that killed Western Pennsylvania. Um, the state during that time understood that there was the possibility of new economy. Uh, they created several new economic development engines that would provide the seeds of a new economy, the Ben Franklin Partnership, and 
uh, several different uh, tech and emerging technology uh, funded initiatives. Uh, but really what was happening was more built upon people, uh, individuals and institutions. Uh, you know, the saying goes, the mills never left. They just moved up the hill and they were called Carnegie Mellon, the University of Pittsburgh and UPMC. Um, the universities and the hospitals that build out the ed and med industry in Pittsburgh became not only the engine of Pittsburgh's resurgence and new economy, but became the rudder as well. So maybe I'll have a little different tact. I think that federal policy and federal work has been instrumental in the history of Chattanooga, maybe sometimes, as Bill points out, for ill and sometimes for good. <clears throat> and so... Um, yeah, some of the some of the policies that that help facilitate or or um, push uh, some of the things that were wrong. We also um, helped revitalize the city. Like Chattanooga would never have had the money to clean up our air and water, ever. And it was the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act, which I'll just point out in a different era. Uh, I think the Clean Clean Air Act passed unanimously out of the United States Senate. And again, a different era. Um, that, that's what allowed us to do this critical work that is the baseline of this stuff for, uh, our internet, um, uh, and fiber system, uh, a quarter of that, um, was, was, um, from the federal government from grants and loans. I say this now as the head of the rural utility service, so I have a, a vested interest in maybe believing this, but the funding that we get from the federal government, again, in retrospect, we could have done it without that, but at the time, we didn't know that, right? And, and that, that funding was incredibly important. And so I would just say that um, we have to have a fa functioning federal government, it has to work well for people. Good policies make a difference. And it's not only that the, that the government makes these uh, funding opportunities available to locals, but that then you have good local leadership that knows how to take advantage of it and make it into the thing that makes your community special. And I'll just say this one more time, kind of builds, not just builds projects, but builds builds the way that you want your city to, to, to come out, that that project fits into a bigger vision of what your community can be. Excellent. Well, we have two, I think, final questions. But before I ask those, Andy, the audience is dying to know. We heard that Bill's favorite movie is Tommy Boy. They'd like to know what yours is. I kind of feel like I do. I have to do something silly. I'm trying to think of uh, of some silly movie uh, now. Um, I, I'm I'm pretty traditional. I'm a Godfather fan, so so. Uh, but I and I can have plenty of of references to that. But it feels like uh, I feel like the Tommy Boy reference has just got to got to uh, stand on its own. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, could could you both touch for a moment on the issue of public service? Why would anyone want to do it in such a hostile and divided climate? And what advice might you have for young people who are contemplating public service? So I'm a believer. Like, that's just who I am uh, at my core. Bill's been doing this for a long time, got started probably before I did um, in, in this. Um, and I, I, I was a lawyer, and um, I really enjoyed what I did. And because the kind of law practice that I did was I helped people make their life better. And then at some point I thought to myself, I can't, I, this is too, I can't just help one person at a time. I need to try to do more than this. And nobody in my family had been in government. Nobody ever wanted to be in government in my family. Probably people in my family still don't want me to be in government. That's a different story. Uh, but but I felt, I really felt compelled that this was the, the way that we could do big things going forward. And I still think that that's the case. I still think that that is today. It is hard. Social media, which rose up really during the time that we were mayor, made, makes the job, local government, much, much, much harder. And uh, 
but I still find inspiration and and uh, incredible uh, moments of of true uh, awesome power in public service. Not I'm talking about my power, but you see this in the world. And the last thing I'll just say is that, particularly when you run for office, um, people tell you their stories. Now they do this in local government anyway, whether you're an administrator of public works or whatever. And so I'll just end with uh, one, one little story. So I was mayor um, and this woman comes in to see me and every time it, it rains, uh, her house floods because of the, of the drain situation. And the, pub, the head of public works at the time, who was not the head of public works that much longer, it was, was a very, at the very beginning, says like why why it's really on her responsibility, not ours, although it's a close call. And I said, well, how much is it gonna cost to, to do this? And she's, he's like, uh, you know, $1,800. I was like, fix this woman's drain. Like, what's, what's, what's going on here? Fix the woman's drain. And so then she wrote me a letter afterward and said, like, what a difference it made in her life that when it rains, her house no longer floods. And how that, changed everything for her. And I'm like, how can you not want to do this job? How can this job not be meaningful to you? Um, and so it's things like that that say, gosh, when you're getting that, that Twitter post, when you wake up five in the morning and you look at your phone and it says something not very nice about you, you have to kind of think about those moments as well. Absolutely. I, I, I um, I never wanted to do anything else, and I have the same background. There was nobody in my family who ever even thought about getting involved in government. And um, I, I just was drawn to it by, like, second grade. And uh, I'm, I love the work, and I hate the politics. And, uh, you know, my staff knew that I was... I played the role of mayor, but I was a very, very, very much an introvert. And um, so I always had to put it on in order to be able to do it. But the fact of the matter was the work, I, it was just something that I passionately loved. And I loved the city and I watched the city get knocked down to its knees and I committed myself that I was going to stay here. My friends had to leave, my family had to leave and I was going to do everything that I could to tried to bring it back and I devoted 30 years of my life to doing it. Um, there was one time when I was uh, at the very beginning of my term as a councilman and I was going through uh, the student union at the University of Pittsburgh and there was a group of students uh, signing postcards and I walked into the, the room and it was uh, Amnesty International and they were sending postcards for the release of a pit professor's wife who was in a forced labor camp outside of Beijing. And I found out the information about it um, and um, I got involved in uh, contacting the Secretary of State, um, Congressman Doyle, our sister city in Wuhan, and being notified about two months later that she was being released. And I just remember telling my chief of staff at the time, you know, a snowflake causes an avalanche. And having that type of action happen on the other side of the world with someone who I would never meet, and then having it happen again in um, uh, Darfur with another woman who was being held in prison, you know, th that little stationary when you are an elected official uh, means something to a lot of people. Um, and if you take it seriously and if you hold that job seriously, you can have a, an amazing effect on the betterment of people's lives. All right, gentlemen, final question. What's next? What's version 3.0? for Chattanooga and for Pittsburgh? For Pittsburgh, it's collaboration. And you know, we used to call it the Pittsburgh way. It's the understanding that the 
challenges that this city will face through infrastructure, through disparity, through economic ups and downs, all the different challenges will only be solved by working together. And it's by formalizing those relationships in real ways where the institutions, the philanthropic community, the corporate labor, and the different levels of government are working together uh, at a round table. Um, it's working on the local level that avoids the pitfalls of what we're seeing at the federal level and the state level where um, partisanship has created paralysis. And it is understanding that the way that Pittsburgh had, was able to get back and get off of its knees and stand back up and shake off the rust was only done by the understanding that we're all in this together. Well, um, I don't spend as much time in Chattanooga as I used to, which maybe gives me a not necessarily worse perspective. So maybe in some ways it's a different and, and better perspective. I, I do think on just a practical level that there's tons of economic development stuff to be done and being really more and more focused on the things that we want to see. And that's changed probably because of COVID and I, I really have to think through it, but like um, trying to get deeper into how do we really want to figure out this next economic development stage to me, that's, that's a super fun project. I agree with, with everything that Bill said. I think that, that coming out of what we've been through, there's probably another moment for a community vision because as, as we were asked earlier, kind of what is, what does downtown look like? Well, Bill and I gave you our answers, but maybe there's going to be a moment here soon for the people of Chattanooga to gather together in an organized process that is facilitated and say, Hey, what do we think the next, the next version looks like in the post COVID era? And, um, and then how do we want to take advantage of these enormous opportunities that we have? And, uh, and again, tell a new story for ourselves. I think I spend a lot of time telling the story of Chattanooga over the last decade. Um, but this time for a new story. That's healthy. Thank you both.